morning, everyone. Or good afternoon. Gosh, what time of day is it? <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Blaze. I'm the director of the Flagler Museum, and it's a pleasure to see you all here this afternoon for our fifth and final lecture in our 30th year of the Whitehall Lecture Series. This year, we've been focusing on the monuments built during this period. Uh, when we were discussing this lecture series, we uh, we realized that that in many ways, four of our presidents represent the various aspects of the American character. We thought it'd be fun to sort of focus on those four presidents and the monuments that represent them. And our fifth and final lecture today is going to be given by James Percoco. You may recall a few weeks ago, he tried to get down here from Washington, but the weather wasn't cooperating, so he wasn't able to join us. But we're happy to, that he made it today. I'm sure he's happy to be out of the cold weather, although it is officially spring now, so it should be getting better up there, I hope. Um, just a reminder, if you have cell phones, make sure that those are turned off. Please don't assume that they're off. Please make sure that they're off. And if you happen to make it into the room somehow with your audio tour one, would you hold that up so that uh, staff can come and collect that? Those audio tour ones have internal alarms that are sometimes set off by the AV system here, and it could be a an interesting experience when that alarm goes off. Um, all of our web uh, lectures are here at the museum are webcast live, so if you're not able to join us for some future lecture, please uh, bear that in mind. You can go to the museum's website, click on the lecture that you are interested in uh, right before it begins, and join us in a, in a virtual room where you can hear the live audio, see the same slides that you'd see if you were present here in the Grand Ballroom. And likewise, all of our lectures are captured uh, and later posted on the Gilded Age History Channel, a website or a web portal that the museum created a couple of years ago, where you can find a collection of videos about America's Gilded Age on a variety of subjects. I want to thank our sponsors for this year's lecture series, the Max and Victoria Dreyfus Foundation and the Palm Beach Post, who helped make this possible. I also want to thank the museum staff who work hard to put these lectures together and to handle the logistics behind the scenes so that everything goes smoothly the day of the lecture. You have in your seats the season program guide. If you haven't um, had one of those in hand before, you'll find that's a nice guide to the various programs go throughout the year here at the museum. There's still a lot going on before the season really wraps up. And even in post-season, there's a number of uh, programs going on here at the museum. So today we have James Percoco here, who is an author and historian. He's here to talk about the Lincoln Memorial. He's a member of the Board of Trustees for the National Council of History Education. He's an educational consultant for the National Archives and Records Administration. And he's a member of the advisory board of the Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Commission. Among the many books and articles he's written for pub publications like the Washington Post, Times, I'm sorry, and the American Art Review, is his book on Lincoln published in 2008, titled Summers with Lincoln, Looking for the Man and the Monuments. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming James Percoco to the Whitehall Lecture Series. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, indeed a pleasure to really be here uh, after the last attempt to get down from uh, Washington, D.C. And I'm very excited to speak with you this afternoon about uh, a subject that is near and dear to my heart. And just to give you a little bit of additional background as to how I got to where, where I am, uh, I taught high school history for 32 years um, and incorporated public monuments and public sculpture in the actual instruction of U.S. history. And that's pretty easy to do when you live on the doorstep of Washington, D.C. Because you've literally got a, what would be the laboratory of democracy at your fingertips where you can send kids out to and they can look at the different monuments. In fact, they had more students tell me after they graduated that they actually learned how to get around Washington, D.C. because of me, <laughs> as opposed to going in on their own. So, uh, so it's great to be here and to speak with you today about uh, how we got to the Lincoln Memorial, which is arguably the greatest public monument in the United States, which will, in a short time, be uh, celebrating its uh, centennial uh, in uh, 2022. Uh, 
when it was, it was dedicated in, in 1922. And one of the things you probably should know early on in this lecture is that the Lincoln Memorial really has nothing to do with Abraham Lincoln as the great emancipator. It's really for Abraham Lincoln, the great American statesman. And so what I'm going to walk you through this afternoon is a series of seven monuments across the United States that I would argue are the best representations we have out of our over 425 plus statues of Abraham Lincoln, including one on the island of Oahu, including a totem pole in Alaska, that represent different themes and ideas about who Abraham Lincoln is. One of the things I hope you've been learning as you've gone through this lecture series is that art really reflects who we are at a particular time and place. It's not static. And art, particularly civic art, uh, that is commemorative in nature, is has a lot to do with how we remember and how we choose to remember, and in, in some cases, what we choose not to remember, and why that all comes to sort of an apex uh, in, in, our, in our public sculpture. So uh, what we're going to do, OK, there we've got uh, Henry Bacon's uh, marvelous temple on the western terminus of the mall in Washington, DC. And uh, inside is Daniel Chester French's magnificent uh, sculpture of Abraham Lincoln as the commander in chief. Now I'm going to dispel a couple of myths. And maybe you've heard these if you've ever been to Washington, DC and gone through on tours of the Lincoln Memorial by park rangers. Uh, there is no uh, head of Robert E. Lee chiseled in the back of Lincoln's head <laughs> looking across the Potomac River to his home, Arlington Heights, although there is a relationship for why this memorial is located where it's, it is located. Nor is there any written evidence that Abraham Lincoln is, in sign language, using his hands to sign A and L. Now, I'm willing to give that argument some credence because Daniel Chester French, in one of his earliest sculptures in 1885, did a piece to Thomas Gallaudet. And Lincoln was the president who chartered Gallaudet College as the first institution uh, for the hearing impaired in the United States. So you could or maybe argue on a stretch that you know French understood sign language and may have put it in. But you know, if, if you're a historian, you've got to go with what the record says. And there's nothing in French's papers that discuss this. I will say that the Lincoln Memorial was placed deliberately on the western terminus of the mall as part of a gesture of reconciliation with the South because the memorial bridge that spans the Potomac River between Washington, D.C. and Arlington, Virginia was the physical barrier, that the, I'm sorry, the physical edifice that reunited the North and South after the Civil War. And like any war, many of the monuments to the presidents or the leaders of those war are really to the generation that served in that war. So in many ways, the Lincoln Memorial is kind of the national memorial to the American Civil War. There were Union veterans and Confederate veterans who participated in the dedication program at the Lincoln Memorial on Memorial Day 1922. Uh, here we have two pictures of Abraham Lincoln, one on the right showing Abraham Lincoln shortly after he was uh, given the nomination as the Republican Party candidate in 1860 for the presidency. And the photograph on the left is often referred to as Abraham Lincoln's photograph of Gettysburg because it was taken uh, by Matthew Brady uh, about two weeks before Lincoln traveled to that small Pennsylvania town to uh, speak a few appropriate remarks at the dedication of the National Cemetery. I like to use these images in my discussions because on the, on the, to the image on your far, on your left, is a much more robust, much more fleshed out Abraham Lincoln. The figure to my right, in the right, is Abraham Lincoln having borne the struggle of the Civil War. And if you ever are in Washington and get a chance to go to the uh, National Portrait Gallery, go to the Gallery of the Presidents and you can see uh, very contrasting images of Abraham Lincoln in life masks. One that was taken in 1860, which I will discuss as part of this lecture, and then one that was taken in 1865, and you can literally see how Abraham Lincoln went from this virile 52-year-old man to essentially a living cadaver. 
Uh, it's, it's very stark, it's very perceptible, and you can literally see how the war is etched on Lincoln's face. To understand any sculpture of Abraham Lincoln, you really need to look at the work of this guy, who was Leonard Volk. And Leonard Volk is the man that gave us the Lincoln life mask from 1860, and then the Lincoln casts of, of Lincoln's hands, which sculptors from 1876 up through 1922 used as their great model for Abraham Lincoln. They didn't have to have Lincoln in the room. In fact, I should uh, mention at this point that sculptors uh, do not do the finished product. They turn the finished product, if it's bronze, over to foundry workers, and if it's in marble, they turn it over to uh, stonemasons who then craft the maquette or the, the miniature into the reality. Here you have uh, Volk in his uh, Chicago studio. And one of the things that's important to understand is that if you were a, you know, we've got TV today, so we get our celebrity status through television. This was a very different world. Uh, but people were, like Lincoln, were very astute politically and understood what certain symbols and signs meant. And if you had a portrait bust of yourself in your home, you had arrived. So Lincoln, after 1860, he's a national figure. He has lost the Senate election in 1858 to Stephen Douglas, but he's become a national, a figure of national prominence. The Republican Party is gaining steam. Lincoln is the flag bearer in many ways of the Republican Party. And Volk, who like other sculptors is a, is a businessman and is looking to make money, has been trying to get Lincoln to get into his Chicago studio to pose for him. Lincoln finally agrees in March of 1860 to do so goes to Volk's studio, Volk lays him down on a, on a, in a chair, tilts his head back, combs his hair back, puts grease on his temples, grease on his hair, sticks two straws up Lincoln's nostrils, and then proceeds to layer on Lincoln's face, plaster. And Lincoln has to sit for 90 minutes encased in this plaster. And um, when the plaster was finally removed from his face, Lincoln in his self-deprecating way said that the process was something less than agreeable. Um, but what, what, what ended up happening was as Lincoln and, and Volk wrestle the negative mold off of Lincoln's face, Volk then goes back in and pours uh, wax into it, and then two weeks later Lincoln is able to go back to Volk's studio, and this is what he sees, which is this impression of Lincoln, and Lincoln's words, according to Volk, was, there's the animal himself. Uh, so that is literally the granddaddy of all Lincoln sculptures, because any sculpture, sculptor of Lincoln doing a serious work of Lincoln is going to use this as a frame of reference. In fact, the artist that you learned about, uh, who did Mount Rushmore, Guts and Borglum, actually wrote an article called The Beauty of Lincoln for a magazine in 1910 called Everybody's Magazine, which was a common day uh, journal that was found in middle class American homes. Um, and so the mask plays a central role in any of these stories. The first really important Lincoln sculpture, and there's this, this, this sort of bookends the, the Gilded Age, uh, because you get the first really important, I'm not necessarily going to call it a great work of art, but it's an important work of art, is this piece in 1876, which is known as the Emancipation Group, which is the first public sculpture of Abraham Lincoln uh, that is dedicated on April 14th, 1876 in Lincoln Park. It's really not a Lincoln statue, it's really about the moment of emancipation in an allegorical way. Uh, the sculptor, Thomas Ball, was an expatriate American sculptor. He actually created the sculpture in his studio in Florence, Italy, which he called Villa Ball. Uh, but it, it's important because it, it bookends, uh, at one end of the mall, uh, Lincoln interpretation from 1876, where Lincoln is still venerated as the great emancipator, to the other end of the mall, two miles away, uh, where Lincoln is venerated as the great American statesman. And what you have here in this composition is you have Abraham Lincoln symbolically emancipating uh, this manumitted bondsman here. And the face of the bondsman 
is actually that which is based on the, on the face of Alexander Archer, who was the last African American returned to slavery under the Fugitive Slave Act. So the figure works in terms of the facial features. The body of the manumitted freedman is actually the body of Ball himself. He actually modeled kneeling down in front of a mirror and used that. We have Lincoln with his hand resting on a podium with a bas-relief medallion of George Washington showing the historic connection of the presidency. And in his hand, in his right hand, he carries a copy of the Emancipation Proclamation. The sculpture was paid for by the African American community, mostly veterans of the United States Colored Troops, also uh, freedmen, American freedmen, but they had no decision in determining what the sculpture would look like. They gave the money that they had raised uh, to an organization called the Western Sanitary Commission, which was out of St. Louis. Sanitary commissions during the Civil War, there was the Christian Commission, the United States Sanitary Commission. They were the forerunners of the American Red Cross, and they took care of soldiers. And so they, the African American community entrusted their funds to the Western Sanitary Commission, and then they went out and sought a sculptor, and one of them stumbled upon, uh, as many wealthy people of the age would do, would, would travel to Europe. He stumbled upon uh, Thomas Ball in his studio in Florence, and saw a small reduction, somewhat akin to this, and decided this is the piece we want to have. And so he telegraphed back to St. Louis, and the, 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 the process was then put in place to erect this sculpture. The keynote speaker at the dedication was the great African American abolitionist, Frederick Douglass, and his oration at this dedication is considered one of Douglass's five greatest speeches. Now, it's really interesting because Douglass and Lincoln actually met three times during the Civil War. You know, Douglass was always on Lincoln, either through friends, through the media, um, newspapers, you know, to get Lincoln to free the slaves, free the slaves, free the slaves. And, you know, Lincoln was a politician and had to deal with a whole separate set of dynamics. So, Lincoln and Douglas did a delicate balancing act in which Douglas learned through Lincoln, you know, what a politician has to deal with to get a policy made. And Lincoln learned through Douglas that African Americans were really, really people. In fact, the, after the first time that Douglas met with Lincoln, Douglas goes back and tells his black friends that Abraham Lincoln is the first man who never made me feel like a black man. Yet when we get to this speech, Douglas is uh, somewhat chastising of Lincoln. He takes Lincoln on as being somewhat cold, tardy, and indifferent on the question of emancipation, but that as a statesman, he, was, he was, uh, had a lot of zeal, that he, he was bound by a statement's, commit, a statement's commitment to the nation. And so he, on one hand, he praises him, and on the other hand, he doesn't. What's interesting about that is that Shortly after Lincoln died and someone went to talk to Frederick Douglass, Douglass said in 1865 that Abraham Lincoln was preeminently the black man's president. In this speech, 11 years later, he says Abraham Lincoln is, was preeminently the white man's president. And I think that says more about Douglass than it does really about Abraham Lincoln. These are two archival images uh, of the sculpture. The sculpture originally faced the Capitol building but in 1976, uh, with the Bicentennial, a sculpture to the African-American educator and activist Mary McLeod Bethune was placed at the other end of the park, and so they turned the sculpture around in 1976 so that uh, Lincoln and uh, Bethune would, would face each other, and that's the composition that you, you see today. These photographs, this was taken uh, within about five years after the sculpture was dedicated. This was taken around uh, 1900. The second sculpture is the work of a man that you're familiar with, principally if you've ever been to Rockefeller Center and you've looked at the giant gilded figure of Prometheus that is over the skating rink. That is the work of Paul Manship. Now, now here's what you've got to understand about sculpting Lincoln, is that any artist in this period, between the 1870s and the 1920s, the, for an artist to have reached 
that place where they've arrived. They wanted a Lincoln contract. If you've gotten a Lincoln contract, that means you had your medal as a sculptor because only the finest sculptors were going to get Lincoln contracts. Manship, prior to this sculpture, had no work in any historical characters whatsoever. He is purely a sculptor of animals and a sculptor of mythological figures. But when he is approached by the uh, Abraham Lincoln Life National Insurance Company in Fort Wayne, Indiana, there is no way he's going to turn down a commission to do a statue of Lincoln. And they don't really give him any parameters. They just say, you know, we want you to do a statue of Lincoln for the steps of our, our headquarters. That had, those headquarters, that's now the Lincoln Financial Group in Philadelphia. But Manship uh, enters into this commission with great zeal. He travels into the deep recesses of Kentucky. If you'll notice, uh, you can see that there is a dog in this sculpture. That is because Paul Manship said, I have found a Lincoln-like dog. Uh, I think it was also Manship's way of getting an animal into the sculpture. Uh, and here's the sculptor with the, with the plaster model. You can see how large the plaster model is as compared to the size of Manship. And Manship said he had the desire to represent the young Lincoln as a dreamer and a poet rather than as the rail splitter. So we're, we're getting into sort of Lincoln and the ideal Lincoln. Who is the Lincoln of the American ideal? Because believe it or not, all of us have some sense of Abraham Lincoln. The Illinois Senator Paul Simon said, all Americans have to get right with Abraham Lincoln. And in some ways we do. I mean, the fact that he's on the mall, the fact that he's on Mount Rushmore, the fact that he's on our $5 bill, he's everywhere. And we do, as a nation, whether we do it consciously or unconsciously, do orient ourselves in some manner to these men that you've been learning about uh, through the lecture series. So here's the sculpture in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, Manship was also smart to understand he could incorporate themes about Lincoln's life into his pedestal. So we then get Manship allowed, you know, playing around with idealized figures, which is his forte. We have Lincoln with his hand in a book. Could be any book. It could be the Bible. Lincoln was very well versed in the Bible, even though he was not a regular churchgoer. Lincoln loved Shakespeare. His favorite play was Macbeth. Lincoln was a lover of the words of Lord Byron. Lincoln was a man of letters. Um, one of the things about Lincoln is, and his, his intellectual capabilities is that Lincoln really rejected the life of, a, of his father. Uh, he's born, you know, he's born in Kentucky, raised in Indiana, Indiana, and goes to maturity in Illinois. But when his father died, when his father Thomas died, Lincoln didn't even go to his father's funeral because Lincoln did not want to have the same hard scrabble life. For Lincoln was always about honing what was up in his head. And that was really important to him. So Lincoln was a voracious reader. Uh, and like any member of um, the intelligent community at the time, he would confound people, particularly since, you know, here's this gawky, lanky, nasally pitched voiced president who is speaking with the eastern elites and it would drive them nuts because not only did Lincoln know he was the smartest man in the room, but the people that he was talking to knew that Lincoln was the smartest man in the room and Lincoln knew that they knew he was the smartest man in the room. <laughs> and so um, Lincoln was very, very well read and Manship is really you know, great to pick up this uh, putting the, the book in Lincoln's, Lincoln's hand. Uh, here we've got the dog, the other hand resting on, on the dog's head. And Manship's argument for putting a dog in there is that Lincoln apocryphally rescued a dog when the family was crossing the Wabash River from Indiana to Illinois. So, so this gave Manship the, 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 the window he needed to put a, a figure of an animal in the sculpture. And it's really Lincoln looking to the future, Lincoln as a visionary. And then these are the four medallions that adorn the pedestal, representing traits of Lincoln's character, patriotism represented by an ego, charity by a mother with her two children, 
fortitude with a Greco-Roman wrestler seated on a lion and a uh, ancient holding an ancient column, and then a figure of, of, of justice showing the four personas of Abraham Lincoln that manship felt all people should recognize and understand. Here's the dedication on September 16th, 1932. Again, this is not the age of TV. This is not the age of smartphones and all the stuff that we, we have at our disposal today. Yet this was a national news story. This, it was a Friday afternoon. The city of Fort Wayne, 1932, worst year of the Great Depression, shuts down. The schools are closed. The town assembles in the square in front of the insurance company and there is a live radio broadcast that is done around the country uh, for people to listen and tune in. You can see um, here the, uh, the, the news cameras for the newsreels and the movie tones. Up here on the uh, stage are aging veterans of the Civil War, much like we are losing today 100 World War II veterans a day. Civil War veterans were fastly fading from the scene uh, in, the 19, in, the in the 1930s, and this was a homage to them. They also, the committee, the insurance company went out and tried to find people who had actually met Lincoln. So there were four people in the crowd who were in their 80s and 90s who had actually met Lincoln, including a young woman young at the time, 15 years old, a Mrs. O.O. O. Smith, who was in the choir, the youth choir, that sang at Gettysburg uh, at the ceremonies where Lincoln dedicated the National Cemetery in 1863. So this was really a bringing together of people who had known Lincoln, people who in the, in the Army had served for Lincoln uh, as Union soldiers, and then for the nation at large. It was also a big program for the American Boy Scouts, uh, the Boy Scouts actually started a program called the Boy Scout Lincoln Pilgrimages, which were done every February 12th. Uh, Boy Scouts would, would take a pilgrimage to the local Lincoln statue, and since they're virtually everywhere in this country, it was very easy to do that. They don't do those sorts of things anymore, but it was a big part of Boy Scout culture for at least half a century. And then I, one of the things that worked really well for me as a teacher was I was a very big advocate of place-based learning. So one spring break, we did a Lincoln road trip, and I took a bunch of kids, and we went everywhere between uh, Cincinnati and uh, Springfield, Illinois, and along the way, we would go to some of the Lincoln statues that I was writing about. It was very important for me as a teacher to get students to recognize that I was at the same time a scholar. I sometimes think when we think about teachers, we don't equate the two, but really they are, they're the same. A, a teacher, he or she who's a good teacher who's worth their salt is also a student of the subject matter and is a, a proverbial student of that subject matter. Now we come to the next statue of Lincoln, which is in Cincinnati by George Gray Barnard. And if you remember in 1982, when the Vietnam Veterans Memorial was dedicated and the rancor and the uh, outrage, so to speak, the discussion, the debate, the controversy, that controversy can find itself rooted in this figure of Lincoln, which was the first true public art sculpture controversy in the United States. And it's not, it's not about how Lincoln looks. It's about, is this the Abraham Lincoln that we want to export to the rest of the world? Because this sculpture was dedicated on the cusp of America's entry into World War I. And the sculptor, George Gray Barnard, as a businessman, understood that once you make that original mold, you can just replicate statue after statue after statue, and you can get money. Think of the statue of Andrew Jackson that's in Lafayette Park across the street from the White House. There's three versions of that. Clark Mills made a fortune on that. The original statue in Washington, there's one in Nashville, and there's one in New Orleans. So once this sculpture is up and dedicated in March of 1917 in Cincinnati, uh, the, uh, uh, the benefactor, uh, the half-brother of William Howard, President William Howard Taft, concocts this idea that now we're gonna go to war against Imperial Germany, we need to give to the capitals of the Allied nations a copy of our greatest American, Abraham Lincoln. And it was decided, certainly with, with um, the sculptor's consent, that we're going to give this one. 
And the argument, again, was, was it's not so much what this particular image of Lincoln is, but is this the image of Lincoln that we want to see representing the United States in London, in Paris, in St. Petersburg? Uh, Robert Todd Lincoln, who was Lincoln's sole surviving son, who managed uh, the Lincoln legacy, worked very hard behind the scenes to undermine that process because for him, this sculpture was an anathema. Uh, he called it, this is the sculpture of my father of the stomach ache, known as Lincoln the colic, because uh, the hands are over the belly. Uh, he also chastised uh, Barnard because Lincoln never wore shoes. Lincoln always wore boots, and in this sculpture, he's wearing shoes. He had a problem with the homespun face, and that's what this is. This is Abraham Lincoln, the homespun American hero, the pre-presidential Lincoln. Uh, this is a picture of Barnard, and if you're familiar with um, <coughs> Medieval art, Barnard was one of the great early American sculptors of, um, of medieval figures. Uh, his, his, uh, the, his collection became uh, the basis of the Metropolitan Museum's art, uh, art from the Middle Ages. And uh, he said, no imaginary Lincoln is an insult to the American people, a thwarting of democracy, a thwarting of democracy no imitation tool of any artist's conception, but the tool of God and Lincoln made Lincoln's self. So for Barnard, this was Abraham Lincoln, the representative of democracy. And you can see here the dedication uh, on the last day of March, 1917. Of course, since this became a controversy, the press weighed in. This is a cartoon that appeared in Life magazine showing what Barnard would do with other great figures in American history, such as Washington, uh, Webster, Longfellow, Farragut, and Grant. This is another political cartoon showing John Bull not very pleased uh, with this sculpture at all. Now, I will tell you this, the statue did not go to London, okay? But it does go to England, and it does have a very fitting ending to the story. Um, and this is on that same road trip. Uh, there is an organization called the Association of Lincoln Presenters. They are men who come in all shapes and sizes. It does not matter to them whether they are short, fat, bald, or whatever. All they have to do is believe that they have the Lincoln persona in them, and they can be part of this organization. They gather uh, every weekend closest to the assassination date of Lincoln at a site in the United States, somewhere related to uh, Lincoln's life. Cincinnati Lincoln uh, was an attorney on a famous court case called the McCormick Reaper case where he was brought in as a third wheel attorney. When he gets to Cincinnati, the two attorneys that are there immediately dismiss him, one of them being Edwin Stanton, who will later become Lincoln's Secretary of War, saying this buffoon Lincoln, this ape buffoon Lincoln shows up. Lincoln's no dummy. He takes the money that he'd been contracted, he goes and he sits up in the gallery and he watches the court case proceed. So that's why they were having their meeting in, in Cincinnati. Um, the statue does go to England, as I said. It goes to Manchester, England. And the reason it goes to Manchester, England, is because Manchester is the Lincoln family ancestral home. The Lincoln family traces its lineage back to the great Puritan, uh, Puritan migration of the 1630s. In fact, if you go to the Anglican church in in uh, Manchester, you will see a Leonard Volk portrait bust in a nave, and you will see a pew that is the Lincoln family pew, and they make they make no bones about it that they're the ancestral home of, of Abraham Lincoln, and uh, so that so that city is chosen as the place for this statue. But there's a second reason. Um, Manchester was the only British city during the Civil War to voluntarily shut down its textile mills in solidarity with American slaves. They did that after Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863. <coughs> the man who was head of the textile, labor textile union, John Bright is the one that led that. There was a correspondence between Lincoln and Bright and the statues face each other in this park in, in Manchester, England. So it doesn't go to London, 
London gets another statue of Lincoln, which we'll talk about in a minute, but it does get this very fitting statue. The third sculpture is by James Earl Frazier. Uh, Frazier was a student and artist uh, who worked under the great American sculptor Augustus St. Gaudens. He's Beaux-Arts trained. Uh, and Frazier wrote, it is a thought I had in mind for some time and I believe a little different from the statue of Lincoln which has been produced. And you can see it says Frazier to Howard Cruz. Howard Cruz was the president of the Abraham Lincoln Association of Jersey City, New Jersey, which claims to be the longest standing association related to Abraham Lincoln. They have had an annual banquet dinner in Lincoln's memory every February on Lincoln's birthday since 1866. They paid for this sculpture. They raised the money for this sculpture, which sits at the eastern terminus of the Lincoln Highway. And uh, it's supposed to be Abraham Lincoln as president, but I think you have to argue that point because it's missing the beard. Uh, you can see it's a clean-shaven Lincoln, and yet Frazier, to his dying day, insisted it was President Lincoln. Uh, I would have to take that argument up uh, with him saying it can't be because he's a beardless Lincoln, and Lincoln had a beard as, as president. Here's the statue today uh, in Jersey City, and what's really interesting is New Jersey was the only northern state that both in 1860 and 1864 did not go for Lincoln in the election. Yeah, and, and there's a reason for this. If you've ever looked at a map of the United States, look at the southern third of New Jersey. The southern third of New Jersey is below the Mason-Dixon line. Uh, most people don't recognize that in 1860, the city that had the second largest slave population in the United States was New York City. New York City thought about seceding from the Union during the Civil War. It was very, you know, there's a, you know, people want to lay the, the sin of slavery uh, completely on the South. It was practiced in all 13 colonies. It was bankrolled by New York bankers and, uh, and uh, insurance, uh, insurance companies. So there's, you know, th this whole idea that somehow we have to, you know, put the whole stain of slavery on the South is really, really unfair because the whole country was caught up in this. And I think that's what Lincoln was trying to get to in his, in his second inaugural address, saying, you know, we're, the, we're being, we're, we're, this war is the payback that God has waged against us for maintaining for 250 years this, what he called, unrequited toil. But here's Lincoln uh, in Jersey City with the statement by J. Owen Grundy, who became the Jersey City, New Jersey historian, who as a 13-year-old boy uh, went to the dedication. These, not unlike dedications of public monuments today, these were big uh, civic events. And, and Grundy was proud that his town had chosen to, to, to honor Abraham Lincoln. One of the perplexities about Abraham Lincoln for sculptors, though, was Lincoln's features. Uh, his legs, in particular, were very difficult because there is evidence, textual evidence, that when Lincoln would sit in a chair, his knees would come up above his chin. Uh, so he was not an easy subject to sculpt because of his physical, physical dimensions. And these photographs kind of capture that uh, in a way that, that demonstrates it, and then again gets to the fact that it, it's a beardless Lincoln. Not too far from Jersey City is this figure of Lincoln who was sculpted by the man who did Mount Rushmore, Guts and Borglum. And it's one of four Lincoln statues that Borglum did. I know you've been exposed to Mr. Borglum's eccentricities uh, in previous lectures, so I won't dwell on it. But I think this is a great statue of Lincoln. This is what he called Lincoln of Gethsemane. This was Lincoln who was bearing the burdens of a crushing civil war. Abraham Lincoln would tell friends, he would say, how is it I, I, a man who could not cut the head off of a chicken, would find myself at the head of such a bloodletting. And this was taken, this pose was taken from uh, some words that Borkman had come across from Lincoln's two personal secretaries, John Hay and John G. Nicolay, where they would say whenever Lincoln got bad news from the War Department, he would just go out and sit on a White House bench and just heave. 
he would just sigh. And so this sculpture is very down to, ground, down to the earth. You can walk up to it, you can pose with it, you can get your picture taken with it, as many people did after the fact. It's a very sympathetic portrayal of Abraham Lincoln, and it really is a very human Abraham Lincoln. You know, you can really see on his face the, the, the strains of what this Civil War has, has done to him. And here's, this is a quote from Borglum's uh, article that I mentioned earlier. I do not think there was ever a grotesque Lincoln. You will find written in his face literally all the complexity of his great nature. And there's a picture of Borglum in his New York City studio with the cast of the statue. Here's the dedication on Memorial Day 1911. And speaking at the dedication and a man who would jump to speak at any Lincoln dedication was Teddy Roosevelt. In fact, if you listen to Roosevelt, Roosevelt will say that it was from speaking at this event that prompted him to run for the presidency again in 1912. And he says, you have done it, you have commemorated, commemorated here in fit form one of the two greatest statesmen that this country has ever had, one of that very limited talent, number of great men whose greatness is for all the world and for all the ages, and I'm not so sure he's not talking about himself as the other great state. Um, but Roosevelt uh, pulls the curtain, which are two American flags. You can see that they've been pulled aside. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the Essex County Courthouse, which I believe, uh, John, you may have to correct me, I believe is also the creation of the architect who designed Whitehall. In Newark, New Jersey, and the sculpture sits there today. And uh, when I was there, I, um, I I had a real kind of epiphany because the statue looks out over the section of Newark that was gutted by the race riots in the 1960s, and everything around that area was touched except this statue. And I write about in my book about what it would what it's like to have this figure of Abraham Lincoln who is full of pathos, full of you know, uh, sensitivity. What that would have seemed like looking at in the 1960s as this city erupts in flames and in, 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 in domestic violence. And not only does Lincoln have to see it really as a person in the 1860s, but as a bronze edifice in the 1960s. And um, Robert Lincoln, who again, as I said, real interesting character in his own right, um, wrote a friend in 1917, because Robert didn't like this statue, and said that it is used as a playground by the hoodlum children of the neighborhood. And I always come back and say that these are real hoods. I mean, <laughs> and the, the Newark uh, Public Library has the greatest repository of photographs of this statue, so most of these images are from that. Here's Jackie Robinson and his uh, nephews at the what was then Lincoln's birthday, which was a federal holiday, uh, placing a wreath. This man here is a 73-year-old Union Civil War veteran by the name of Osborne H. Oldroyd, who hiked in uh, 1912 the miles between Washington, D.C. and Newark, New Jersey, to come see the statue. He became the first great collector of Lincoln artifacts, and his collection became the foundation of the collection that you see in Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. Now, this is the statue that goes to London. This is the great statue of Abraham Lincoln by the great American sculptor, Augustus St. Gaudens. St. Gaudens is Beaux-Arts trained. He's a man who's arguably the greatest sculptor that this nation has produced. He uh, in 1887 gets this commission to do for the city of Chicago a figure of Lincoln and this will be the eventual statue that a cast is replicated from and is sent to London so you can go outside of Parliament and you can in in the square outside of Parliament and you can see a, a reproduction of this sculpture as you can in Mexico City. Um, St. Gaudens is a Beaux-Arts sculptor, as, a, as one of the first Americans to be trained in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris, had a classical education. So St. Gaudens was always aiming to find a place between realism and classicism. And this is the 
the second time he does that. The first time he does that is with his statue of 1880 of Admiral uh, David Farragut in Madison Square Park in New York. But here we have Abraham Lincoln, the great American statesman. And what's important about this sculpture is that this sculpture is the one in which after this point in time, the idea that Lincoln is the great emancipator recedes into the background and Lincoln, the great statesman, takes ascendancy. And it comes out of this particular piece of sculpture. So much like television influences culture, or any form of art influences culture in life, in American life, the same is said for this statue. What we have here is Abraham Lincoln in a moment frozen in time. It is not Lincoln of the Gettysburg Address. It is not Lincoln of the Second Inaugural. It is merely Abraham Lincoln rising up about to say something. He's rising up out of the, the chair of state, which is an important artistic uh, composition here because what the chair of state does, and the chair of state was, by the way, the idea of the architect Stanford White, who worked with St. Gaudens on the pedestal design, to give the sculpture the necessary volume so that it would fit and feel right in the space. Because if you took this chair out of there, you would just lose the figure of Lincoln. The chair is what gives Lincoln the space in which to act and which to move. And the great thing about St. Gaudens is that St. Gaudens had his greatest genius was he could make bronze seem like living flesh and blood. That was his great gift to the, to the world of sculpture. And, you can, and I've stood in front of this statue many times, and you can literally feel a particular kind of energy emanate from it because that's how good he was as an artist. If you notice, uh, Lincoln's right hand is uh, on Lincoln's lapel. That's the hint to the classicism. St. Gaudens is a breakaway artist, put people in their contemporary clothing, not in togas. Uh, we, we have uh, Lincoln looking down, meditative. Uh, for those recipients of the Lincoln Prize, which is the book awarded each year to the best Civil War book written in, in America that year, they get a copy of a portrait bust of St. Gaudens as Lincoln as part of, their, uh, part of their prize. And this is hands down the, until we get to the Lincoln Memorial in 1922, this is the greatest Lincoln statue in the United States. It appeared in, in, in newspaper, magazine, articles, and advertisements. Very popular sculpture. And the date of that place? This, the date of the sculpture is 1887. Now, this is looking at it from the entranceway to the park. Laredo Taft, the great American sculptor from Chicago, who is also America's great historian of American sculpture, said that standing before it is like standing before the soul of America. And what's interesting um, about this statue in, ter in terms of the stories that I uncovered is that um, Jane Addams of Hull House fame uh, would go to the statue during the great railway strike of uh, the Pullman railway strike of the 1890s. Uh, Jane Addams, you know, someone to the left of the political spectrum, would come to the statue from Hull House every day just to gain inspiration from it. The great irony there is that the man who is managing the rail strike from Pullman's end is Lincoln's son, Robert, who was president of the Lincoln, uh, of the Pullman Palace Car Company. So you've got this great juxtaposition of America uh, between those of the haves versus the have-nots, the left and the right. And somehow these stories all get collided, come together in many Lincoln statues. And that's because Abraham Lincoln is one of the most uh, hijacked figures we have in this country. If you have Lincoln on your side, you know, you've got America on your side, and everybody is really aware of that, as are the Chinese. If you go to Beijing, and you go to Tiananmen Square, and you are on a tour, they will tell you, this is the great Mao's mausoleum. We modeled it on your great Lincoln Memorial. And it's true, you look at it and you go, my God. In Taiwan, they took it a step further for Chiang Kai-shek. If you go to Chiang Kai-shek's grave, you'll see Daniel Chester French's figure of Lincoln with Chiang Kai-shek's head on it. Um, and there's a, there's a reason, I mean, you might say, well, why the Chinese? Well, there's a reason. And the reason is, is that even though all Chinese find their identity, no matter what their political stripe is, in Confucianism. And for them, they saw Lincoln as a man who embodied Confucian ideals of harmony and unity. And that's why, that's why he is venerated 
in such a way in, in China. And when I, I had an opportunity to go to Beijing uh, with a delegation of teachers, and we were looking through a world history textbook, and Lincoln is taught alongside people like Bismarck, Cavour, Garibaldi, because they're all unifiers. And it was really important, the whole concept of unity is really important for him. Uh, this is Langdon Morse, the man who posed from Windsor, Vermont, for the figure of Lincoln. Here are two of St. Gaudens' early sketches of Lincoln. You can see one with the paper in it, one without. Uh, here's the dedication on, in 1887. Here's St. Gaudens in his studio with the clay model. Here's the dedication, the unveiling. And here, this takes me to the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., which I would argue is the greatest public sculpture in the United States. Uh, Henry Bacon turns the Parthenon on its side so that the, it faces the, the mall, the, the most uh, sacred ground in America. And inside we have Daniel Chester French's 19-foot, uh, uh, 28-separate, two-ton blocks of marble sculpture of, of Abraham Lincoln as the commander-in-chief or the war president. Lincoln is draped in an American flag. His hands, I'll show you a close-up of his hands. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. This is French in his studio in New York with the working model. Here's French and Bacon in the, the memorial chamber the day before the dedication. Here's the statement above Lincoln's head, which reads, in this temple is in the hearts of the people for whom he saved the Union. The memory of Abraham Lincoln is enshrined forever. Slavery was not to be part of this dialogue with this memorial. This was Lincoln, the great uh, uh, preserver of the Union. Lincoln's hands. Uh, one hand is closed, his left hand is closed like a fist to show his resolve, his steeliness, his fidelity to the Union. The other hand is open, demonstrating Lincoln's compassion and his kindness, not only to the Southerners after the Civil War, but also, you know, Lincoln, much to Edwin Stanton and the War Department's consternation, had a real habit of pardoning soldiers. And their mother would write to him, please don't have my son executed for dereliction of duty. And there are hundreds of these that Lincoln did. It used to drive him nuts. Um, but Lincoln has this great sense of empathy and humanity. Uh, and that's exacted in, in, in the hand that is open, showing his compassion and openness. And then uh, French writes a letter to a woman in Saratoga, New York, who he'd done a sculpture for his, this woman's uh, husband uh, says, I wanted to convey the strength of the man and the confidence in his ability to see the job through. It's this letter from uh, French to, uh, to Henry Bacon writing. And then here's the dedication in 1922. And Warren G. Harding, I think, really gets to the nub of any kind of public veneration that uh, this memorial, matchless tribute that it is, is less for Abraham Lincoln than for those of us today and for those who follow after. And certainly, you know, that's true. Monuments are put up not necessarily for the person that they honor, but really for subsequent generations. And the Lincoln Memorial is a place of history as well as a place of memory. Um, these three images, this is a still from Frank Capra's great movie, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, which is really a movie about Abraham Lincoln. He uses the name Jefferson Smith, but Capra models Smith's character on Lincoln. And if you, how many of you have seen this movie, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington? You remember the scene where he goes to, to the Lincoln Memorial? There's, a, there's a, an 11 second clip of an African American man walking into the chamber and taking his hat off, then Capra cuts back to the father, the grandfather, and the grandson, and reads the word freedom from the Gettysburg Address, a new birth of freedom. So there's a, there's a lot of play in that movie that has to do with Capra, and Capra's belief about who Lincoln was, and what he saw as Lincoln. 1939, later that year is the Marian Anderson concert, where on Easter Sunday, 1939, she uh, gives the concert because she's been denied access to sing at Constitution Hall, uh, run by the DAR because Washington, D.C. is a segregated city. And then, of course, in 1963, we have 
the great remarks by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, at the March uh, for, for Jobs and Peace. But I want to go to the next image because this is the image that appeared on Life magazine a week after King's address, and it's not King. And the reason I put this in there is because just like Lincoln, we've done the same thing with King. We've elevated his status by his words in the intervening years. Obviously, in 1963, people living at the time didn't necessarily view this as a great speech in the way that we tend to think of great speeches. Rather, they put on the cover of Life magazine a. Philip Randolph, who was really the genius behind the March on Washington. The original March on Washington was supposed to take place in 1941. It does not. And the other man is Bayard Rustin, the, ground, the man on the ground that organized the march. So I think it's really interesting that this is what appears in Life magazine right the week after the march. And of course, we've got this great cartoon by Bill Malden uh, from Chicago after the Kennedy assassination. Here you've got Stevie Nicks and, and, uh, uh, and Stevie Wonder and uh, at a concert on the grounds of the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, it's interesting, I went and spent several hours just sitting at night at the Lincoln Memorial in the summer. Not once did I hear anybody say, gee, I wonder where Mr. Smith goes to Washington was shot. What I heard a lot was, I wonder if this is where they shot Forrest Gump because there's that scene that also takes place there. So it's a metaphor for who we are. So uh, I have, uh, this was the letter of, uh, to, from French to Katrina Task. I have, I've lived with Lincoln so long that I feel as if he has become a personal friend. And in the seven year odyssey I had to uncover Lincoln's identity through these monuments to Lincoln, I came to feel the same way. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. questions, so let me, yes sir. It's not a question. Okay. It's a comment. I had a privilege to see Joseph Ellis speak about George Washington at Francis Tavern several, many years ago. And no cue cards, wonderful presentation. I never thought that would be topped. You have, you're so interesting and have such charisma and you know no cue no cards. I think every one of us is honored to be here today. Yes sir. David Victor Brennan. David. Yes sir. One of the great sculptors that did Lincoln on the penny. Oh okay on the on the on the penny. Yeah. I'm surprised you didn't just add a little well, you know, it, it was really hard to weave this list down, and <laughs> um, I did get to see the statue in, in Hawaii, but that wasn't until after the book. Um, you know, I, I did use the penny as my, my book pitch that Lincoln's on the penny. Um, that, that's something that's never come up in, this, in any of my presentations, but that's something worth to consider adding, so thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yes, sir. Where did you teach? Where did I teach? I taught at West Springfield High School, which is in Springfield, Virginia, which is about 15 miles south of Washington, D.C. It's in Fairfax County. So, lucky students. Pardon? Lucky students. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. I was surprised to hear that Lincoln did not attend his father's own funeral. But what year was that? How old was he? What was going on in his life? And could you elaborate a little bit more on the relationship that he had with his father? Certainly. Um, the Lincoln family moves, let's see, Lincoln's, okay, his mother dies when he's, his, his, his mother dies when he's nine. Thomas Lincoln remarries Sarah Bush Johnson, who then becomes Sarah Bush Johnson Lincoln, who becomes Lincoln's stepmother. I want to say that's around uh, when Lincoln is 12. The family moves in, I think, from Kentucky to Indiana. 1832, I think. Um, Lincoln's relationship with his father was that Lincoln's father believed that Lincoln was lazy. 
that he was lazy because he wouldn't do manual labor, but he'd be willing to read books. And Lincoln was interested in intellectual work, not physical work. Um, he wanted to be as far away from his father as possible with any sense of identity. Um, he acknowledged his father's death, but did not go to the funeral, as, as I indicated. Um, the reason the Lincoln family moved from Kentucky to Indiana is because they were Baptists, but in Kentucky, Baptists practiced the institution of slavery. Thomas Lincoln didn't like slavery, so he moved to Indiana, which was a, slave, a state that didn't uh, practice slavery. Um, Thomas Lincoln was interested in building up, uh, eking out an existence on a farm. And Abraham Lincoln, you know, he wasn't. I, I, the best way to put Abraham Lincoln is, if Abraham Lincoln were a child in my classroom, he'd be in the gifted and talented program. I mean, that's the kind of mind that a man had. Uh, and he just, you know, he just realized early on that that's not what he wanted to do. And I wouldn't say he hated his father, but there is one incident where his father knocks a book out of his hand. And Lincoln will talk about that later in a very short biography that he writes prior to the 1860 election. Um, but I just think he wanted to distance himself from his father because he just didn't want anything to do. You know, Lincoln is always, you have to look at Lincoln through two through economic eyes. You know, the whole argument, one of the things that was hard to teach about kids was the whole argument of slavery versus free labor. You know, Lincoln's interest in, interest in free labor because he understands talent takes you to the top. I mean, you're here in the house of somebody whose talent took them to the top. That's what Lincoln was all about. And he just wanted to make sure every American had it, what he would say was a, an equal chance at the, at the race of life. Um, so you also have to understand, I mean, Lincoln is fairly wealthy for his time when he takes the nomination of the presidency. He's, you know, the attorney for the Illinois Central Railroad, and he's made a lot of money defending and attacking his client. Uh, so he's no dummy, and he understands the value of a dollar, and I think for Lincoln that was a huge part of his motivation to a certain extent. Yes, sir? Almost every uh, one of the moral abortion has an interesting history behind it often rather controversial. Could you tell us a little bit more about uh, the Lincoln Memorial, how Bacon got chosen, the design, and sure. the history? The, the Lincoln Memorial was, was chosen in a very undemocratic way. <laughs> um, President, uh, President William Howard Taft, as president, made himself president of the Lincoln Memorial Commission. <laughs> that would never happen today. Uh, they handpicked Daniel Chester French, well, they handpicked Henry Bacon, Okay. Bacon, who had a long-standing relationship with French, requested that French be the sculptor of choice. French had to resign his chair as chairman of the Commission of Fine Arts, which is the overseeing agency that oversees you know, one of the three groups that has to sign off on any monument in Washington, D.C. Uh, French and Bacon um, collaborate from 1915 to 1922. Originally, they're going to put the sculpture in bronze. They realize when they get the chamber built that bronze is going to be too expensive. So French pays out of his own pocket to have the plans changed and the sculpture carved in the Bronx in marble. A rail car is a railroad line is built directly from the Bronx to the Lincoln Memorial, where they unload the crates of of the pieces of uh, Georgia marble that have to be assembled in the chamber. Uh, it's decided to put Lincoln in the Parthenon because that was the great place of Greek thinking. And Lincoln was a great thinker, uh, just flipping it on its side so it would angle itself properly on the mall. Uh, the agreement was made to include on the north portico the words of Lincoln's second inaugural, which does include the word slavery, and they let it stay in there. And on the south portico of south facade, is the Lincoln's uh, Gettysburg Address, which are the two public papers, Lincoln's two great public papers. Interestingly, when the memorial was dedicated, the reflecting pool was not filled with water. When the memorial was dedicated, it was filled, and to French's absolute dismay, the face of Lincoln on the sculpture was washed out because they didn't take into consideration the sun bouncing off the reflecting pool into the chamber. So French had to go back to Congress, and if you go to the Lincoln Memorial, you go to the statue, you turn around, Lincoln behind you, you look up, you're going to see giant arc lights that project down, that counterbalance the light that comes in off the reflecting pool. 
uh, which, which was done very sh shortly before uh, Daniel Chester French died. So, um, controversies with the Lincoln Memorial, 75 African American dignitaries are invited to the memorial. They, Washington, D.C. in 1922 is a segregated city. They are immediately <coughs> escorted to the rear. 21 of them walk out in indignation. Um, the speaker at the, at the dedication was Robert Moton, the man who assumed the mantle of Booker T. Washington as president of Tuskegee Institution. His speech was severely censored. He had submitted beforehand. Interestingly enough, during the March on Washington, John Lewis's speech is equally censored uh, by A. Philip Randolph. Um, John Lewis's speech was to be more reactionary than it was. He didn't want to change it, and there's actually a whole academic study comparing the two speeches with photographs of, of those two speeches and the, the censorship that took place at both the dedication and then at the great event in 1963. So that would be the, that would be the one controversy that would would be with the memorial. And in World War II, during the air raid drill, part of the memorial was shot at by a, an errant artillery officer on, I believe, the Department of the Interior building, ironically. Uh, there was a blackout guy had his gun, he fired the gun, and it hit one of the stanchions on the top, there these encrusted stanchions on the top, and damaged that. But they repaired it, but that's a little known story as well. Yes, ma'am. Um, could you explain the symbolism of the uh, memorial statue where it looks where um, President Lincoln's hands are coming down, what looks like the armrests? Yes, his arms, uh, let me go back. back up. Okay, the armrests are actually fascines, the Roman fascines representing the Roman Republic. They just don't have the blades at the top, but this is to be, this is the chair of the American Republic. And because it's the chair of the American Republic, French puts in these fasces as part of the chair of state, as part of the uh, sculptural device to bring in that idea of, of republicanism. Yes, sir? How did Robert Todd Lincoln feel about the memorial when you talk about how he felt about other statues? Oh, he was at the dedication. And he was, uh, he was 82 at the dedication. He loved it. He thought it was great. Um, he endorsed it, um, and he died in his home in, in Manchester, Vermont, uh, a happy man knowing that he had preserved as best he could his, his father's legacy. It was a hard, you know, he's, Robert Lincoln is the only Lincoln that's not buried in the tomb in Springfield, Illinois. He's buried in Arlington National Cemetery. He's buried there because uh, his wife didn't want to be buried with Mary Lincoln, and his wife also said that Robert Lincoln was a man in his own right and that uh, he should have his own burial plot. So he's buried in, in Arlington and is the only in Lincoln not in the family crypt in Springfield, Illinois. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. I bet you'll never look at another Lincoln statue the same way again. Thank you for that, Jim. You enlighten us all. A couple of things to think about. I mean, we're looking at this picture here of, uh, of the Republic statue. And it's an irony here that uh, up until this point, we were fiercely uh, wed to the idea that we were a Republic of Independent States. But it was Lincoln who really changed that, if you think about it. So there's a bit of irony with that. I also wanted to mention that uh, Daniel Chester French and Bacon knew each other from what? Heard me talk about this many times, the Columbian Exposition where they worked and which really led to the shaping of Washington as we know it today, the final production of our national city. And lastly, if uh, go back to that picture of Daniel Chester French's sculpture of Lincoln standing. Let me get the one that's... St. God's name? St. God's, sorry. St. God's sculpture of Lincoln standing. Look at that for a minute and then think about the sculpture of Henry Flagler. There's nothing different about this sculpture except the head, really. Um, the sculpture of Henry Flagler, we don't know who the sculptor was. Probably an American student studying in Rome, commissioned by Flagler's wife, Mary Lily Keenan. Uh, Flagler would never let it be erected during his lifetime. He said he'd be embarrassed to pass it. Um, 
he also said, by the way, if they ever put up a statue to me, it's going to say pro bono publico, and in small letters below that, a damn fool for his work <laughs> in Florida. But um, we have, we dedicated uh, for the town centennial in uh, 2011 a statue of Flagler that sits, nor would normally sit on Royal Poinciana, which used to be called Flagler Avenue, by the way. Uh, and it will go up again once the Flagler Memorial Bridge, new Flagler Memorial Bridge is uh, finished. But you can see the original statue at Flagler College in St. Augustine. And he's posed Flagler, whoever the sculptor was, in exactly the same way, left foot forward, a toe over the edge of the platform, hand on the left hand on the jacket, looking, in the case of Flagler though, looking straight out. So I, I'm sure that student in Rome was influenced by, by a St. Gaudens sculpture of uh, Lincoln, which was very well known by then. Interesting, interesting connection, huh? All right, well thank you very much for that, Jim. What a way to wind up the series. Thank you all, hope to see you.